God, awaken us to your presence here and around us. We confess that it's only by your grace that we can hear and know the truth of who you are. So we ask for your mercy and your grace to open our ears. Holy Spirit, would you make new what has become familiar? Come blow through this place, through the stubborn parts of us and the parts we protect. Help us to unfurl our hearts to be tender to you. Jesus, our Lord, we want to remember and to respond to the radical truth that is hidden in plain sight of this season, the wild truth that you came to earth on that very first Christmas. Would we fall deeper and deeper in love with you, God? And in love, would we respond with joyful participation in a world longing for your light and your life. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing to you, O Lord. Amen. Amen. So the scripture of the day comes from the Gospel of Luke. Luke 1, 39 through 50 from the NLT version. It says, a few days later, Mary hurried to Judea, the town where Zechariah lived. She entered the house and greeted Elizabeth. At the sound of Mary's greeting, Elizabeth's child leaped within her, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Elizabeth exclaimed to Mary, God has blessed you above all women, and your child is blessed. Why am I so honored that the mother of my Lord should visit me? When I heard your greeting, the baby in my womb jumped for joy. And Mary responded, Oh, how my soul praises the Lord, how my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he took notice of his lowly servant girl, and from now on all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One is holy, and he has done great things for me. He shows mercy from generation to generation to all who fear him. This is the word of the Lord. So today marks the first week of Advent. And I know some of you guys are like, we just celebrated Thanksgiving. It's Advent season this Sunday. And we imagine Mary singing the song with her hands clasped and her doe eyes looking to the sky, her beautiful brown hair, beautiful, obedient, submissive white Mary. And we see, imagine Elizabeth and Zachariah, the old to be parents of John the Baptist, we envision Gabriel coming with the news of the Messiah, being conceived in Mary, and we imagine Joseph, confused and a little aloof, but generally going along for the ride. You don't have to have grown up in the church to be familiar with these characters. We see them lit on lawns, printed on cards. We have our children dress up and play the parts. The story of Advent is one that is so familiar and so novel. But if we're honest, there's a disconnect, isn't there? We come into the season a little bit unsure why we celebrate and why we sing joy to the world, as beautiful as the worship team did it. We know cognitively that it's a profound and a timeless story, but the joy sits on the surface like oil to water. And why? It's because we've become spectators to the story of Advent, and for good reason. None of us feel like we can relate. None of us feel like we can relate to Mary or Joseph. And we also question, can it be joy to the world when the world is literally on fire? You know, climate change, scientists are saying we have five years before the climate change effects will be irreversible. That's, that's daunting, isn't it? Our nation continues to gaslight our black brothers and sisters, and we grapple with systemic racial injustice from the courthouses to the streets. The housing right, crisis right here in Southern California, how many of us saw an unhoused person on our way to church today? And apparently Nazis are back, or maybe they never went away. When we are faced with these seemingly impenetrable and insurmountable issues, we wonder, does it really matter? Does it really matter what I do and what I believe? And we despair. Despair looks like apathy and it looks like anarchy. We either become apathetic, numb, calloused, or we rage against the machine. We become anarchists and seek to break the system and ultimately we burn out and become hardened and cynical. 
How many of us ping pong from one extreme to the other? I know I do. Both suck the joy out of us, and they leave us feeling powerless and passive. But what if I told you that the Advent story we know and love has truths hidden in plain sight that will crack us open? There is more to the Advent story that will empower us with hope and infuse us with joy in a world tempting to sink us in despair. So who's interested? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So what I read before is what's traditionally known as Mary's song or or called the Magnificat. Can you guys say Magnificat? Magnificat? Magnificat. And the scripture I read was just half of it. How many of you guys were born in the 80s and 90s when VHS tapes were broken into two, two tapes? Did, in our, our household, we always lost the second tape. And just recently, I was listening to a podcast and found out that The Sound of Music has a second tape to it. And apparently there's Nazis in the second tape. <laughs> Anyways, so there's two parts. <laughs> there's two parts to the Magnificat. And if we cut off the second part, it changes the whole dynamic. So let's continue with part two of Mary's song. His mighty arm has done tremendous things. He has scattered the proud and haughty ones. He has brought down princes from their thrones and exalted the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away with empty hands. He has helped his servant Israel and remembered to be merciful. For he made this promise to our ancestors, to Abraham and his children forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. So what's beautiful about this structure is that this Mary song alludes to songs sung by uh, female prophets in the Old Testament when God intervened powerfully. Like Miriam's song in Exodus after God parts the Red Sea and takes his people out of slavery. Deborah's song in Judges when God intervenes in battle and leads them to victory and Hannah's song in response to when God intervenes in her barren hopelessness and gives her a son whom she dedicates to the Lord, her child eventually becoming the prophet Samuel. So scholars suggest that Mary's song most closely parallels to the song Hannah sings in 1 Samuel 2. It says, those who are well fed are now starving and those who are starving are now full. He lifts the poor from the dust and the needy from the garbage dump. He sets them among princes, placing them in seats of honor. So in both Mary's and Hannah's song, there's this beautiful reversal, an exaltation of the lowly and the poor and the oppressed and God scattering and sending away the proud and the powerful. So if you were the original audience of this Luke narrative, you'd catch the cadence of this and the linguistic similarities in Mary's song with the songs from the Old Testament. People hearing Mary's song in Luke's gospel would begin to notice and connect the dots. Something is about to happen. It's like the song, Old Church Basement by Maverick City Music. It's an old hallelujah with a new melody. Just as God intervened in Egypt, as he intervened in battle, in the dark of hopelessness and barren seasons of our lives, God is about to enter the scene, and someone is coming. Mary's song is an old hallelujah with a new melody. And she begins her song with her posture and her place. It says, oh, how my soul praises the Lord, how my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for God took notice of his lowly servant girl, and from now on, all generations will call me blessed. Now, if you're taking notes, you can highlight the word lowly. The term for lowliness in Greek is tapanosin. It describes misery and pain and oppression and persecution. And when Mary describes herself as a lowly servant girl, it's not a metaphor for spiritual humility. It's based on her actual social position. So what's the backdrop of her song? The lowly are being crushed by the Roman Empire, but it's not just the empire that's exploiting her people. The temple and the local government are extracting taxes from the people. So the people are starving and the culprits are foreign, domestic, and religious. Only 2% of the 
are in the elite and the majority are living on subsistence level existence. So the very system and the very economy is rigged against the poor. And not only is her nation suffering, but she herself is struggling as a young peasant woman. She is a teenage girl being crushed on all sides, including the oppressive patriarchal society she is in. So we think of our young sisters in Taliban-occupied Afghanistan, some of whom dress and live as boys just to get an education and go out by themselves. We think of the indigenous migrant moms just four hours from here in Texas who are being crushed on all sides from the cartel, from the government, and from their own people. Just as these young women in the modern age are fighting for survival and dignity, this is the young mother of Jesus. She is oppressed, she is poor, and she is brown. Mary is not the silent, obedient, passive woman that we imagine her to be. German theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer said this during an Advent sermon in 1933 before the Nazis executed him. He said, this is not the gentle, tender Mary whom we sometimes see in paintings. This song has none of the sweet, nostalgic, or even playful tones of some of our Christmas carols. It is instead a hard, strong, inexorable song about the power of God and the powerlessness of humankind. So I imagine Mary pregnant with the unborn Messiah with her fist in the air, her foot on a stone, her voice echoing out. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away with empty hands. Ben Wildflower created this image that I love so much. The Magnificat, if you guys are able to put that up. Can you guys imagine the Christmas plays if we dressed up our little Marys like this? <laughs> I think that would make Advent a little bit more accurate, don't you think? But that's actually why I'm wearing business up top and rebellion <laughs> on the bottom. <laughs> Mary is a young revolutionary singing in the midst of oppression, singing prophetically into a tomorrow that God is ushering today in her very body. And though her position of powerlessness hasn't changed, she knows God is entering into her darkness, into her very body. And when we think this, we think, man, that's powerful, isn't it? God is for the poor. He's for the oppressed. But I imagine if you're anything like me, you're probably thinking, but I am not poor and I'm not oppressed. I'm actually pretty well off. Maybe some of you guys, we are here in Southern California. So how do we enter into the story? The only way we can recapture and live into the joy of Advent is to understand that we are truly powerless without God. When PB returned from his biking trip in Texas, I wept and I cussed after hearing about the accounts of women there. And guys, I'm not a good cusser. It was, it's, you know there's people who are good at cussing and then there's people who are not good. It's like, it sounds really awkward. I'm like that person, but I just didn't have the words. There was no response other than cussing after PB came back. Mostly women and children have taken up temporary shelter under the overpasses near the Rio Grande River and are attempting to make it into the safety of our nation. PB told us how women flee unimaginable violence. Their husbands are often dismembered. Their daughters are often raped. Their sons are often kidnapped into the cartel. And to flee that, they have to choose the most vulnerable of their children and travel for over 30 days by foot across Southern America. He told us how they are dizzy at night because they lie awake holding their children close because there's the constant threat of cartel members kidnapping their children, even there. I was filled with anger and frustration when I heard that most cannot cross even though they're legitimate asylum seekers because we have stationed military personnel at the border to stop them. I cried when I heard that many of the children are taught how to swim across the river so they can cross the river at night. The youngest being five years old and they put floaties on his arm. Without getting into the politics of this, because I know it's a hot button issue and guys, I don't have the, the answers. But as Christ followers, think for a second 
of what kind of existence and what kind of profound violence these women and children are fleeing, that the risk of drowning in a river is better than the place that they came from. Being a mother now of a beautiful and wild one-year-old, it is unimaginable to travel by foot only to hope with all hope that she will cross the waters at night into uncertain safety. That night, I bathed Maya in the safety of her home, in clean water that turned her skin a little pink. I put her into bed in her own room with a safe roof over her head, and I thought to myself, God, my heart is broken, but what can I do? I am just a suburban Asian American woman nestled in Diamond Bar, California. My husband is a resident physician, so we're crippled with debt, but he's got a stable career ahead of him. I am neither poor nor powerful, important nor influential. I am just some middle class, seemingly invisible majority. Have you ever felt this way before? Stuck, overwhelmed, Have you ever felt powerless? Have you ever been stuck in addiction? Your body is against you and you can't break out of the cycle no matter how hard you try. Have you ever felt powerless against your own depression or mental health? You can't pull yourself out or will yourself to feel a different way. Have you ever lost your job, your home? Have you ever watched bills pile up and the money in your account drain? Have you ever heard the doctor say that your child is sick? Have you ever watched your marriage fall apart? Have you ever seen your mom die or a loved one die? I know many of us members experienced the heaviness of grief when we lost Angela after many months of praying and interceding. We are powerlessness. We are powerless against the reality of death, of sickness and injustice. And when we face the brokenness of our reality, the powerlessness against our very sin and humanity, it feels like we are fighting with the ocean. We despair. What does despair look like for me? I do nothing. I sleep. I buy things I don't need. I distract myself with TV shows and movies and social media. I am joyless. I am numb. I protest. I want to burn down the system. Despair feels inevitable. We are profoundly powerless to change the world on our own. If you have ever felt powerless, you can identify with Mary. And that means the good news of great joy is for you too. Because Mary's song is for anyone who feels like things will never be different. The good news of great joy that Mary sings is that the Messiah, the one we have been waiting for, is coming. We might be powerless, but we serve a God who is powerful, and he is coming. I love how John 1.14 says it in the message version. The word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. The good news of Advent, the good news that we must recall is that God came into our neighborhood, and he arrived embodied and in the womb of a peasant girl. Mary's song is praising God for the kind of salvation that involves concrete transformation. The power and the joy of the Advent season reminds us that God is not a far, absent, and careless father. He came, he is present, and he is capable. Reverend Dr. Gardner Taylor once beautifully described the gospel of Jesus coming to earth by saying it this way. Jesus gave up his hometown and glory and came here to this low land of sorrow to be mocked and ridiculed in our interest. He came here to this place, became time trapped, death eligible, pain capable for you. We have a powerful God who loves us. And God did not just come to save our spirits. He came to save our very flesh, and he shows us this by coming himself. The Magnificat is one of the New Testament texts that has the most hopeful, political, and liberating language. And because of this, did you guys know that Mary's song has been banned throughout history? 
In the 1980s, the government in Guatemala banned any public recitation of Mary's song because it was too dangerous and too revolutionary. Because the poor were so inspired by God's preferential love for them that they believed change was indeed possible. In Argentina, mothers whose children disappeared during the dirty war placed the Magnificat's words on posters throughout the Capitol Plaza and the military outlawed any public display of this very scripture. Empires, governments, those in power know that hope in God is more powerful than despair because in God, change is inevitable. Hope is inevitable. So Mary's song sparks in us this anthem of resistance again because it reminds us that God is on the side of the oppressed. And in Jesus, we see that the poor, the vulnerable, the marginalized, all those who count for nothing in this world are not only precious in the kingdom of God, but also are liberated and beloved. Because of Jesus Christ in us, the hope of glory in us, we are a threat against the empire of death, darkness, and despair. And this also means that Mary's prophetic declaration serves as a warning for us to stay alert, awake, and sensitive to the heart of God. Her song warns us against the complacency and apathy toward the oppressed and marginalized in our midst, lest we become scattered and sent away as the proud and the privileged. So what does this mean for us? This means you and I, we have a part to play in God's redemptive story. We are called to herald the joy that comes from the truth that God has come. And in his name, all oppression will cease. Willie James Jennings said, Joy is a defiant act of resistance against the forces of despair. This is why the Advent story is so powerful, because it reminds us that we are part of the revolution, that we are part of the resistance. Because Jesus has come, he is here and will come again, our hope is more powerful than despair. And you cannot keep the hopeful down. So how do we live as the people of revolution? How do we live into this resistance of joy? What did Mary do? She receives Jesus in faith and she sings prophetically of God's intervention and lives as though she is pregnant with the Messiah before she even sees the tangible signs. And she carries Jesus in her womb and releases him into the world. We too are called to cultivate Christ, the hope of glory in us, and to manifest his presence in our world. In Galatians 2.20, it says, my old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Christ lives in us and we were designed to bring his presence into the world. I love how Teresa of Avila says it. Christ has no body now but yours, no hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes through which he looks on compassion on this world. Yours are the feet with which he walks to do good. Yours are the hands through which he blesses the world. Yours are the hands, yours are the feet, yours are the eyes, you are his body. Isn't that beautiful? In a couple weeks, several of us are going to go to the border to witness the reality and the lives of the asylum seekers. And if I'm honest, I'm scared. I really am. I'm scared because I know it will break me. I'm scared because I don't know how I'm going to continue living once I've seen the reality there. I'm scared because there's nothing I can do. Really, there's nothing I can do. But I say yes, and I go with hope and trust that God is with me, but God is also there. He hears their cries, and these women and children are so precious to him. I might be powerless, and I might not have the right answers, But Mary's song reminds me that God is the one who crashes into our reality. It is he who enters our darkness and transforms the world. 
and I want to be where he is. I want to be an instrument of his presence. As I've been preparing for this sermon, I was so moved by this thought by St. Therese. She says, You know well enough that our Lord does not look so much at the greatness of our actions or even at their difficulty, but at the love with which we do them. When we remember the truth that God entrusted his precious son in the arms of the poor and the oppressed among us, that he arrived into our darkness, our natural response is joy. And it is joy that propels us into action and kicks us out of the passivity that the empire of despair wants to keep us in. But what St. Therese reminds me of that is so revolutionary and beautiful about the economy of God is that in all the ways that we participate with God is doing, it is not marked by the great things we do, but at the love with which we do it. That even the smallest act done with the greatest of love is a threat against the empire. And by doing so, we are nurturing Christ in us and living as people of joy. So whether you're participating in what we're doing corporately as a church by volunteering in recess or hosting as a safe family person, giving a gift through um, Olive Crest, or giving canned foods to LA Mission, or personally when you show kindness and grace to your coworkers, your boss, when you show gentleness and patience to your spouse, when you are present with your child, We can trust that as we are faithful in nurturing Christ in us and practicing all things in love and living with joy that God himself is doing the rest. Amen. I'm going to invite Pastor Brian up to close us in prayer and the benediction. What a powerful word, yeah. Uh, that was a really good first sermon. <laughs> I think when I did my first sermon, I was um, 18, 19, and I, I really hope people destroy those tapes because I didn't know sermons could be this good. A um, couple weeks from now, we are going to go down to Reynosa. Uh, We're going to land in McAllen, Texas, and I'm taking Heidi, some worship leaders, and and Nixon, and we're going to go and meet these moms again. Um, And I'm really glad that Heidi brought up these mothers of Renosa on the border, because I really believe uh, more than us blessing them, more than us, I don't know, you know, giving them hope or giving them resources they are challenging us to live a life of deep and honest faith. Because when I talk to them, guys, and, and you know, we're going to do something when we go down there. Heidi is going to interview them, and she's going to actually take pictures, and we're going to hopefully get it out to all of you so you can see their faces. You have to see their faces. And I want you to see their kids. I want this to be seared into your mind that these kind of things exist in our world and they shouldn't. And this is why we have hope in our God because he's going to change this kind of stuff. Amen? Because Advent and Christmas really doesn't matter unless it matters to those around us. If it's just for us, it's just a little holy club that we've created for our little safety. It has to get out of here. If you really want to enjoy Advent, make it go out of here. (laughs) Hello? Anyways, what do they have to teach us? When we went down, when I went down, and I think about your sermon, Heidi, I, I, I feel like I saw Mary's. Because honestly, guys, like I'm, you know, let's be honest, we're we're realists. We live in a real world. You know, we live off of facts and information. And I look at their situation and I'm like, I don't think you're going to make it. I don't think you're going to make it across this border anytime soon. Our government's messed up. They can't handle anything right. We've totally ignored the border. We made a mess out of this mess, already mess, right? I don't know. But when I looked at them, you should see their eyes. It's not an, uh, they're not eyes of like wishful thinking. 
They're eyes of conviction. And when we prayed, when we sang, when we ate together, they would constantly say, Pastor Brian, I know, I know in the deepest part of my heart, God will rescue my kids and I. Man, when I heard that inside of me, I just, I broke. I'm like, what would life look like if I had Jesus in me like that? And my life was awaiting for Jesus rather than anticipating more hardship, more darkness. Come on, somebody. More depression. What if my life was a constant anticipating of more of God? I believe Months ago when I went, I saw Advent embodied. And so, I just want to echo what Heidi's saying. I want to invite you to sing Mary's song this week. I want you to live pregnant with Christ in you. What would your life look like if you believed he came and he's coming again? If you really believed he came and he's coming again. What would your life look like this week if you were an Advent embodied person? Let's pray. Come, Lord. I want you to invite right now, God right now, and say, God, like Heidi said, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to enter the season of Advent the same way. I don't want to enter it as if I know, and it's like an old song. I want it to be a new song this year. Impregnate me with hope, with vision. Yes. We are all too aware of our powerlessness, God. So we lay that down as well too. Right now, go ahead. Not just for the sake of the world around you, but I'm talking about even your own darkness, even your own powerlessness, even your own failures. I want you to lay it before God and say, God, I anticipate you. I anticipate you. I anticipate you. Yeah, there it is, Lord. More. Yes. That's what we're going to do, Lord. This year, this Christmas season, this Advent, God, we are surrounded by darkness. We are surrounded by atmospheres of depression and, 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 and being in languishment, God. We, but we say, you are in us. Grow in us, Lord. Help us to be uh, people who host you well in our hearts. And we anticipate, God, break through. We anticipate God, renewal, we anticipate healing, not just for the world around us, but for ourselves as well. We thank you for this word. We thank you for this sermon. I thank you for the, the ministry team that's going to preach this season. We can't wait for more of you. I bless this church in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. May Christ be victorious in each of you. Amen. Amen. Amen.